Brothers, uh, before we get started, inshallah, come close as possible. الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هل ينظرون إلا الساعة أن تأتيهم بغتة فقد جاء أشراطها وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لا تزال طائفة من أمتي يقاتلون على الحق لا يضرهم من خالفهم حتى تقوم الساعة أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم انفعنا علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه وأزواجه وذرياته Respected brothers, sisters, those listening at home, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته it's an honor to be here again, alhamdulillah, after a long period, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the brother involved in organizing this event, a much needed topic and a very important topic which is connected to the belief of every single Muslim who follows or endorses the aqaid of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Today we will be talking about Imam Mahdi and certain things in relation to the life of Imam Mahdi. Before we get started, we need to go back into time and discuss a very important hadith reported by a noble companion of the Prophet ﷺ. And this companion is by the name of Hudayfa bin Yaman radiallahu an, sahibu sirri Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the one who held the secrets and was the companion of the Messenger of Allah who was loved, respected, and in whom the Messenger of Allah confided his utmost secret conversations with this companion Hudayfa radiallahu an. Hudayfa radiallahu an mentions that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when talking about the end of times and talking about from a bird's eye view the history of mankind from the advent of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained that there will be approximately five stages that this ummah will go to. The first stage, Hudayfa radiallahu an says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that inna awwala amri deenikum that the first affairs of this deen of yours is the affair of nubuwa and mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What was the message of Allah referring to? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was referring to the moment wherein Allah blessed him with being a prophet of Allah all the way till he left this dunya, this phase or stage known as the first stage was the label given by the message of Allah as Nubuwa and Rahma, the stage of prophethood and mercy. How was it mercy? Very briefly, you can understand this, that it was mercy in the sense that the, the waves of Jahiliyyah were pushed back through the advent of the Prophet 
the, the, the qualities and traits of Jahiliyyah were wiped away by the Prophet You know, there is, this will not be an exaggeration to say that the Nubu'a and Rahma was so powerful that even in today's so-called civilized society, Western civilization, even today they appreciate the values and the teachings of the Prophet In the days of Jahiliyyah, the Kuffar couldn't appreciate the sayings and the teachings of Islam. But today we have the civilized society, even when they look upon the teachings of the Messenger of Allah, even though they will still frown upon them, in one extent they actually appreciate the teachings of the Prophet This was the first stage. This was known as the stage of Nubuwa and Rahma. This lasted for approximately 63, well, from the age of 40, Till the demise of the Messenger of Allah in the 11th year of the Islamic calendar, this is the stage of Nubuwa and Rahma. Then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam told the companion, Hudayfa radiyallahu an, who is passing on this important knowledge to us, that there will be a second stage, and that second stage will be known as Summa Takunu Khilafatun Ala Min Haji Nubuwa. Then there will be a stage wherein Khilafa will be established upon the methodology, upon the nature of Nubuwa. And what does the Messenger of Allah mean here? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was talking about, referring to the leadership of the four Khulafai Rashidin, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali radiallahu anhu. They will be following in the footsteps on the same methodology of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu ruled approximately two years a couple of months, two years and a couple of months, every single moment in the life of Abu Bakr was in accordance to the way, methodology, and the pleasure of the Prophet And if you don't believe in this, then you cannot be counted amongst Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama. If you don't accept this, then you can't be from those who actually will be saved on the Day of Judgment and will be admitted into the into paradise and taken away from the fire of Jannah. The second phase of this Minhajin Nubuwa, this methodology of following the way of the Messenger of Allah, it was in the life of after Abu Bakr, we know as who is the next in line, who, we do, who do we call? Bin Khattab radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu anhu ruled for approximately 10 years. And within these 10 years, he is walking, he's talking, He's sitting, he's standing. Everything that he did was in accordance to the methodology of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Everything that he did. Yes, if he did make a mistake, then even that mistake is in accordance to the methodology of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then came the Khilafah. After he was assassinated, Umar radiallahu an sat down with a few companions, and he made a council, not like the council and the MPs that we have today, who will say one thing and do the opposite. And unlike the governments of today, who will present a beautiful picture, but behind the scenes, it is a total opposite of what they are presenting. These six individuals who Umar radiallahu and chose, such people that each and every one of them was guaranteed Jannah by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, taking each and every individual from amongst those six, if we were to isolate them and just follow one of them, the likes of Ali, the likes of Uthman, the likes of Talha. If we were to take any one of them and follow their lives, then it is guaranteed. If we follow it in exactly how they live their lives, we will be guaranteed Jannah in the year after. These six men were chosen by Umar radiallahu an. And it wasn't the case that you choose these people, six, because they have some sort of interest inside the governmental affairs or because they have business, they have a large business venture and they will be able to influence this business venture of theirs inside the running of the government. Not like we have today, unfortunately. Umar radiallahu anh chose these six people and from amongst these six they all decided that the next caliph who will run 
hold the reins of the methodology of the Messenger of Allah, it is going to be none other than Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anhu. Then after Uthman, when he was martyred, the next person in line was none other than the beloved of the Messenger of Allah, Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Now these four individuals lived their lives and it spans approximately 30 years. When you calculate each and every person's uh, leadership, it, it equals approximately 30 years. These 30 years in reality was the light, they all followed the light of the prophethood of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Many of us think that on the demise of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Nubu'a terminated. Yes, of course. There is no prophet to come after the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the light of the Messenger of Allah expanded from the demise of the Messenger of Allah across these 30 years. And it finished upon the demise or upon the Khilafah of Ali, including the leadership of Hassan, the son of Ali radiallahu anhu. This is the second stage. Second stage. Then Hudayfa radiallahu anhu says, the Messenger of Allah said, after this, after this leadership that will arrive, will be, it will be upon the manhaj of the Messenger of Allah. Then there will be a third stage. What is this? It will be leadership or it will be a kingdom which is based upon zulm and oppression. And what was the message of Allah referring to? Abdan in the Arabic language actually refers to, you know, your molars in the back of your teeth. When you and you don't want to let go, you hold very tightly with the back of your mouth. So this leadership will be such that the leaders inside this kingdom will be such that they will be greedy for keeping the kursi and the chair. Not all of them, some of them. Some will be good, some will be bad. And this refers to the leadership or the rule of the Banu Umayya, the Banu Abbas, all the way up until the Ottoman Khilafah. So from the year 41 Hijri all the way till the year 1338, when of the Ottoman Empire, collapsed and it fell onto his knees. Then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, after this third stage, a fourth stage will come. And the fourth stage that I'm going to explain to you today, this is the fourth stage which we're going through at this moment in time. And what is this fourth stage? The Messenger of Allah said, Summa Mulkan Jabariya. Then there will be kingdom or leadership, a monarchy, wherein it will be forced upon the people with zulm, oppression, and the people and the masses will not like what is being presented to them. Inside this leadership, it will be based upon father and son. It will be based upon a monarchy wherein zulm and oppression will be covered in such a way that people will be thinking that this is good for us. But in reality, there will be a lot of zulm and oppression behind this paperwork and behind this agenda that will be presented to us. From the demise of the Ottoman Khilafah, my brothers, you know, the last Ottoman leader, we all know who he is, Sultan Abdul Hamid II. When he was in power, and before he, obviously, before he was abolished the Khilafah, the, the leader of, the founding father of Zionism, by the name, a man by the name of Theodore Herzl, he mentioned himself, he said, as long as Sultan Abdul Hamid II, then the Jewish nation can never ever look towards the promised land and can never take away Palestine and establish a Zionist state inside the land of Palestine. Once that was abolished and we see today that they've not only established, established the state of Israel, but they are doing zulm upon zulm upon zulm, not only upon the Muslims living inside Palestine, but throughout the whole world. Throughout the this fourth stage, my brothers, this fourth stage, this is what we want to talk about. Inside this fourth stage, when we look at the ahadith of the Messenger of Allah from various angles, we can realize when you connect the dots, you can come to the conclusion that certain ahadith the Messenger of Allah said or statements that he mentioned, they are in relation to this fourth stage. And if it's not this fourth stage, then it's in relation to what we are seeing at this current moment in time. Prophet said, Yanzilu bi ummati bala'un shadid. 
my ummah will be faced with a lot of difficulties from who? Min, sal, min sultanihim, from the leaders about them. The message of Allah will go through a lot of difficulties. Min sultanihim, hatta tadiqa al-ardu, hatta tadiqa anhum al-ard. To such an extent that the earth will become constrained and difficult for them to live upon. It will be so difficult. Have you ever asked yourself, my brothers, we're not talking about liberal Muslims. We're not talking about secular Muslims. We're talking about orthodox Muslims. How difficult life will become for such believers. You know, we all, and I don't want to go into detail, we're all seeing the propaganda in the form of LGBT and homosexuality. We're all being faced with liberal ideas and many of our own scholars and those in the suit of ilm and knowledge are presenting ideas to us to take us away from the methodology of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And those who have a brain and those who have an intellect, they will be able to understand. Those will be able, who have a, an iota amount of aql inside their brain will be able to understand, including the topic that we will be discussing today, my brothers, Imam Mahdi. There are many reformists today out there who have come out with certain interpolated, ajeeb, strange ideas saying, there's no such thing as an Imam Mahdi in the religion of Islam. There's no such thing as a promised man who will save the Ummah from the brink of collapse, collapsing. There's no such thing as this. Some people come forward and say, brother, when you say Mahdi, when you look inside the books of a Hadith, then Mahdi is used as a terminology to indicate somebody who is guiding. I can be Mahdi, he can be Mahdi, and our beloved Boris Johnson can be Mahdi as well. And people are coming out with these false ideologies. And to counter this argument, my brothers, one simple thing is, okay, if that is the case, if Mahdi can be, labeled, anybody can be labeled as Mahdi, then why inside the books of our Hadith, which we will discuss, why has the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained one specific individual, one man, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about Abu Bakr, Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnati al-khulafai rashidin al-mahdiyin. Follow my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided caliphs. He called them al-mahdiyin as well. So if that's the case, is Abu Bakr al-mahdi, is Umar al-mahdi, al-mahdi. In the linguistic aspect, yes, they were guided by Allah. But the, according to the Islamic terminology, under the degree of who the actual Mahdi will be, that is a separate individual who will come near the end of times. So my brothers, at this current moment in time, we're faced with Mulk al Jabariya, a, a kingdom or leadership wherein Zulm and enforcement, a totalitarian, a, a, a type of system where if you don't agree with the public or general, general masses ideology, then you will be included amongst those who are strange and weird and ajeeb. The Prophet ﷺ told us not to worry about this situation. Allah You know, subhanAllah, we have people in our communities in this day and age, all they do is pray Salah, go home, and only they only practice about 2-3% of the religion of Islam. Pray Salah, brother, pray your Salah, do your small little ibadah, and that is it. Is that what Islam is all about, my brothers? Islam is more comprehensive than what people present to us today. It is much more greater than what we think of ourselves. You know, the message of Allah left Makkah, migrated from Makkah to Medina. And when he was in Medina, constantly those Muslims who were persecuted in Makkah, he inside, living inside Medina. People like me, brother, I'm okay. My self-interest, as, as long as my... As long as I'm doing my azkar and my zikr, who gives the damn up? We talk about this very soon. You know about the topic of Imam Mahdi. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said when he was talking about the, the the latter stages of when Imam Mahdi and the Jal and the fight will take place. The Messenger of Allah said Imam Mahdi will send a group of horsemen to go and find out. Of Over the homes of the believers, he will send certain horsemen to go and verify this information. The Messenger of Allah said in the hadith, 
inni la a'rifu asma'ahum wa asma'a aba'ihim i know very well their names those hosts mahdi i know their names i know their father and father's names and on top of this i even know the color upon which the horses they will ride to go and verify that information that is because the messenger of allah had an attachment with this with this group of people kids this is politics brother this is with this and that that is what that is why my brothers because of the lack of information and islamic true authentic knowledge because of this my brothers i have personally met people who will disregard those muslims who are sacrificing their lives in the path of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and are different parts on the basis that i am better than him or he doesn't understand anything about the religion where do we fall and then upon this basis and when you look at here when you hear these things and meet certain individuals my brothers it's not to our amazement that when the jal arrives or imam mahdi arrives people will start labeling imam mahdi and his jamaat as terrorists and as those people in islam that is why my brothers talking about this discussing these topics especially in relation to imam mahdi the end of times is as important as learning how to do ghusl how to do istinja and it is as important that is why the ulama of the past they recorded the topic of imam mahdi inside the books of aqi aqida aqaid to ensure that the later generations their aqaid are not corrupted by liberal muslim secular muslims and the reformists whether they are in the uk or outside the world so my brothers this fourth stage that i'm talking about keeping this in mind the message of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said there will be a lot of difficulties upon my ummah they will be faced with a lot of difficulties but the question i want to ask you my brothers is does islam teach us that we throw down our learning our ilm our knowledge and give in to the fitnas and trials or what does islam teach us or does the message of allah say to us make sure you remain firm upon your deen when the jal will arrive the jal he will be like this he will be like this he will come across you recite the opening verses of surah al kahf he will have this with him he will have these trials and tribulations with him. in the message of allah say ya ibad allah fasbutu o slaves of allah remain firm upon your deen remain firm upon your deen and today we have people who are giving into homosexuality astaghfirullah we have masajid organizations who cannot allow the imams to even deliver a topic of homosexuality because they feel like they based around that masjid that they run and this is happening all around the uk my brothers this is happening everywhere all around the uk the message of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and there will be a time wherein the believers will find it difficult for them to follow the iman and islam but at this time what did the message of allah say the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that in the deen of bada ghariba the religion of islam started off strange very strange when they when the muslims would go to the kuffar and say who do you worship we worship one allah the kuffar would come to the the, the companions and say aj'al al-alihata ilahan wahida inna hadha la shay'un mujab he's made 360 idols into one this is a jeep strange this is strange when you tell the the western civilization today living in the uk when you tell them we worship one allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they will throw arguments at you and say is then does god even exist they will say to you that this is a materialistic world science proves that there's no such thing as god but as muslims do we give in to what they are saying or do we remain firm upon our teachings of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said tu ba lil ghuraba Islam started off strange and it will return back to its former state for two bar in ghuraba glad time just rabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam this hadith has been rated in various variations the wordings has varied and he said in one occasion he said who are the ghuraba the strangers alladheena yuslihuna ma afsada an-nas ma fasada an-nas they are those strangers or those people strangers those people who give into the 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 statements of the government they say yes whatever our beloved mother is saying we have to go with this whatever boris johnson is saying we have to go with this 
Don't use your brain. You know, everybody was talking about the COVID as well. And just a few days ago, a brother sent me a video. COVID, if you don't take the if you don't take the injection, not only are you gonna die, your whole family is gonna die. Our beloved Biden, Joe Biden, because we have to follow British values. I follow British values. That's why I label everyone as beloved. Beloved, our beloved Damas Barakat and Joe Biden, when he went to visit Israel and he came back on his return journey before this, when the when the COVID started, what was he saying? If you don't get vaccinated, the only way to save yourself from the this virus is by getting vaccinated. Once the injection took place a couple of days ago, our beloved Joe Biden, Damat Barakatun, what's happened to him? He's he's bed bad. And he said, I've been affected with, with COVID-19 as well. Not only him, but many of the leaders around the, 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 the country, not only in the UK, but around the world. You know, why my brothers? Because we've left the teachings of Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, Mufti Rizal Haqsab, the Grand Mufti of South Africa, when this whole uh, saga was taking place in South Africa, this reached him as well. May Allah is reward him and preserve him, subhanAllah. The, the only Mufti that I know, maybe there was others as well, but when I was checking up, he was the only Mufti when faced with this dilemma. Should you stand close, you know, shoulder to shoulder in the south, or should you separate and keep two, two miles distance from your own Muslim brother? Because the COVID is going to get you. Like you're going to live in this world. So he was the only Mufti who I came across where he said, Mufti Ridal Haksa, Damat Burakatu, he's actually in the UK now doing a tour and visiting the dark rooms and the masajid. He said that when you sit in the bus and when you go shopping and you do your shopping in your Tesco's and your Asda's and whatever you have in South Africa, he said for those few minutes, when you are sitting next to your neighbor in the bus, there is a chance of you attracting the COVID and there's a chance of you not getting it. If that is the case with traveling, then why should we give the fatwa and say that you should stand right next to each other, you should separate from each other on the basis that it is a possibility. He gave the fatwa and he said, no, you need to stand next to each other and perform the salah. You need to stand, why? Because these are people known as Muraba. Muraba. They are those who correct the ways of those when the people become corrupt. Corruption, not, corruption means when you are faced with trials and tribulations, when people are pulling you away from the true orthodox teachings of Islam, you push not only yourself, but others around you that you need to come back onto sirat e mustaqim You need to come back onto sirat e mustaqim In this day and age, what do we have, my brothers? Brother, as long as I am okay, as long as I'm praying my salah, next person can go to hell. Community can go to hell. This is not the methodology of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa you know, people personally as well, they say, oh, Shaykh, what's the point talking about this anyway? People are not going to change. People are not going to do anything. People are still going to go on their ways. But we present a verse of the Quran to them. And what is that verse? Ila rabbikum wa la you know, in the, in the Quran, Allah mentions about a group of mischievous Jewish individuals who had, there were scholars as well, who had got together and they were, they were prevented from doing any form of activities on the day of Sabbath, on the Saturday. So what they did was they got together and said, Friday night, well, well, they were prevented by Allah that you're not allowed to do fishing because they live by the seashore. You're not allowed to fish on the day of Saturday. Allah made it haram. It was a test. It was a test like the COVID was a test from Allah. Let's see, are they going to follow the principles of Islam and my beloved messenger or are they going to put their heads down to our beloved Joe Biden, Dabat Barakatu and our beloved Boris Johnson, Hafizahullah. <laughs> I have to say this because this is British values, my brothers. I follow the British values. Now, the thing is, my brothers, what happened in regards to these people? What happened when they, they decided to come up with a scheme and the scheme was on Friday night we will make whole They will get trapped inside those holes on the day of Saturday will come. Well, let one day go by and then we'll collect it the next day. We haven't done anything wrong. We haven't done anything wrong. And when they were doing this, there was three people. Those who were involved in this, another group of people who were saying, brother, what's the point even doing this change anyway? What's the point of doing it? And then there was a third group who was telling them, 
And that third group, when they were asked by the second group, why are you doing this? What's the point of this? There's no benefit in it whatsoever. They're not going to change anyway. They said, Ma'adhiratan ila rabbikum wa la'allam yatakun. Number one, when we stand in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will ask us about every single second, every moment in your life, when homosexuality was thrown at you, when LGBT issues were thrown at you, did you just turn your head away and say, it doesn't matter, my family is okay, I don't mind whatever's happening, as long as I'm alright, Self, selfish behavior, as long as we did this, what do these people say? We only are doing this so that we can present an excuse in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, we told them, it wasn't up to us to guide them, it is up to you, but we did our job. We did our job. And that is the mentality of a true believer. The message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as I was explaining, the Ghuraba, my brothers, in this fourth stage, who are the Ghuraba? When they are faced with so much pressure, the message of Allah said, Ghuraba, strangers are those people in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, it is mentioned, Unasun Salihun. They are a group of pious people in a community wherein majority of that community are those who disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what do they do? They try to rectify the situation. They try to rectify the situation. Now coming back to the point, my brothers, if we, if we, we need to ask ourselves a question, am I ready to be a stranger in the court of Allah? Or am I ready to be like those people who don't bother about the deen of Allah, don't care about the environment, the future generation, my children? I'm not bothered about this. I'm just scared about my money, dunya, penny, pound. You will be questioning the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Messenger of Allah said, my ummah will face a lot of difficulties and then these difficulties will come. Then what did the Messenger of Allah say? He said, Hatta yaba'at Allahu rajulam bin itrati. Hafiz Zakaria Saab, who's the local brother here, his son was reading the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Masha Allah, tabarakallah. In the Arabic language, the Messenger of Allah said, Continuously, a lot of difficulties will come upon the Ummah until when Allah will send a man from my family. And what will he do? He will fill the earth with justice, just as the earth will, was filled with zulm and oppression. And let's make it clear, this man is not MBS, Muhammad bin Salman. This man is not Muhammad bin Salman. Get, throw this out the window, this idea. That person who makes Best, he makes his best friend Israel and doesn't bother about the welfare and the well-being of Muslims cannot be a man on the way of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah will send a man from my family. He will send him from my family. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also mentioned in another hadith, he said, Umm Salama, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she says, the Messenger of Allah described his, gave us a description and said that he will have a short, thin nose or a long nose, uh, a tall, you know, like a slanty type, long, short type of nose, which is like high from the top. And then it turns more a button type of nose. And he will have a very large forehead. And having a large forehead is a sign of intelligence. He will be wise. He will follow. He will look like the messenger of Allah, but much more than looking like the messenger of Allah, his akhlaq will be in accordance to the akhlaq of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa before he left his dunya, before he left his dunya, what did he say? Abdullah bin Abbas says, the messenger of Allah said to us, he told us to do three things. Out of the three things, one of them was, and this is in refutation to Muhammad bin Salman, one of them was, akhrijul mushrikina min jaziratil arab. Make sure you kick out the polytheists, the mushrikeen, the Jews and Christians from Jazeera to Arab, from the Arabian Peninsula. What is the Arabian Peninsula? Mecca, Medina, and parts of the Hijaz, and also some have mentioned parts, certain parts of Yemen, and others have said Yemen is not included. But Mecca and Medina is included. What do we have? Our beloved Muhammad bin Salman, what is he doing? MashaAllah, I don't want to give evil eye. He is having best friend, a, a very good relationship and friendship with the Zionist state of Israel. This man cannot be Muhammad, this man cannot be Imam Mahdi. Then the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went forward and explained that when he will emerge, what will happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, when will the sign be that he will emerge? The message of Allah said, Umm Salama radiallahu anha narrates that yakunu ikhtilafun in the mawti khalifatin. The message of Allah said, that the time where Imam Mahdi will emerge will be at a moment wherein there will be a dispute 
amongst a ruler and leader of the Muslims. And a man, and in the hadith, he mentions that this ikhtilaf will take place in Medina Munawwara. And when this ikhtilaf takes place, a man will run away from Medina, who will be later on known as Imam Ali. He will leave Medina and travel all the way to Makkah al Mukarramah because he doesn't want anything to do with this leadership. He doesn't want anything to do with his leadership. The Messenger of Allah says he will arrive in Makkah al Mukarramah. And when he will arrive here, in Makkah, a group of believers will see this individual, they will recognize him, and they will say that we want to pledge allegiance on your blessed hands. Pledge allegiance on what? On eating chawal, roti salam. Pledge allegiance on what? That we open a dal room, a masjid, and there's no disregarding these, I'm not belittling these places. But what I'm trying to do is get to a point here. Pledge allegiance upon what? Upon what? Pledge allegiance upon jihad in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something which, as I mentioned in the khutbah in the beginning, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تزال على الحق لا من خالفهم حتى تقوم الساعة. The Messenger of Allah said continuously, from the moment Allah sent me as a Messenger of Allah, Till in this narration is not mentioned in another narration, he said, until the last one of my ummah fights and kills the jal, Allah will continuously make a group from my ummah victorious. They will not be bothered about those who forsake them, and they will continue. Last one of them fights and kills the jal. Who is the one who's gonna kill the jal and fight the jal? Isa alayhi salam. Somebody said a few years ago, he said to me. Uh, the, the, the ex-leader of uh, of Labour, the one everybody was looking up to, I forgot his name, is one out of my head. Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn. Somebody said, Jeremy Corbyn. I said, Yad, what are you doing? This is how deluded we are, my brothers. Wallahi. And it's not only the fault of the awam and the public, it is the fault of following certain so-called religious leaders who don't teach you anything about your religion. They're only there for the penny and the pound. Or they're only there to ensure that their business center continues to survive in a secular liberal society. The message of Allah said, now try to understand this, my brothers, focus on this. Why did the Prophet ﷺ, out of all the different various works, efforts of deen that will take place, why did the message of Allah emphasize upon this one effort of the deen? That about the battlefield, about jihad, why did he emphasize upon this? Because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa knew that there will be not the enemies, the, the, the so called Muslim ummah who will tarnish the reputation of those who are fighting in the battlefield for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to remove this, the Messenger of Allah, what is he doing indirectly in this hadith? What is he doing? He's actually saying, I am the flag bearer for this Jamaat. I am the one who's taking this Jamaat forward. And if you want anything to do with the religion of Islam and the true orthodox teaching of Islam, then you have to understand this one little hadith of the Messenger of Allah. Mm -hmm. Imam Nawi Now I'm going to explain something to you which you're probably not going to hear from anybody else. Imam Nawi Rahmatullahi com commentating on this hadith, what does he say? Very beautifully. Because you know the scholars, they weren't influenced by the government's they weren't influenced by those who are above them. They only spoke the truth for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether you mention their children and their wives are taken away from them, they spoke the truth for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did Imam Nawi say? Imam Nawi said, this hadith has been mentioned with various wordings and the message of Allah included inside this hadith, the muhaddisin, the fuqaha, the mufassirin, those who are calling, doing da'wah and tabliq, those who open da'wah rooms, all forms of activities of deen that can, a person can think of is included inside this hadith. However, the number one top, number one list, or the one that is on top above everything else, it is those who are fighting in the battlefield in the, for, the, for, the, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we want to be part of the jamaat of Imam Mahdi, and if you actually want to follow the true teachings of Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then we need to practice and understand what this hadith is saying. Nobody is saying, go kill out John Smith on the road. Nobody is saying that you go and stab people up because you heard this hadith. 
and neither do I need to apologize for some killing that takes place, whether it's in the UK and America, because it's got nothing to do with Islam. Why should I start apologizing for something that's got nothing to do with my religion? I don't need to sit here and say yes, because this happened over there. Has, has our beloved Boris Johnson apologized for his comments on the hijab that he mentioned? He was, he was shamed and embarrassed by a Sikh MP in the House of Commons. And even then he didn't apologize. And people like me and you, you know what they do? What, what our people like to do? They start giving interpolated and achieve strange interpretations in regards to these types of hadiths. I met a brother in Birmingham, I'm talking about Birmingham. He came to me and said, Molana, there was a local mufti. And he said, he went to him and he said, what's the translation for this verse of the Quran? And he was talking about, if I can remember correctly, he was on the last page of the 14 Jews. I can't recall the verse at the moment, but it was in relation to attacking and fighting. And the translation was simple, straightforward. And he went to that, the brother went to him and he said, can you translate? He said, I don't know the translation, come back to me later. Yeah, you're a, you're a mufti and you can't give a translation to a verse of the Quran. Are you such a coward that you can't translate a verse of the Quran? This is my brother's the barrier in this country of fighting and fighting, I don't mean physically, legally fighting for our, our religion, our rights. The barrier is up here and we're all the way at the bottom, you know, right underground in the, in the sewage, in the canals. That's where we are. Because they never brought it upon us, we brought this upon ourselves. We brought this upon ourselves. Salman Farsi, when he accepted Islam, the Kufar of Quraysh came to him and they said to him, li Salman. He was said to Salman Farsi, this is in the book, in Sayyid Muslim. Somebody came to him, one of the leaders of Quraysh, the Kufar of Quraysh, and said, Your Prophet, kulla shay. Your Prophet has taught you everything. He said, even to the extent of sitting down and urinating, doing toilet. He's told you this as well. If that was me and you, no, no, I don't sit down. I don't you sit down to go toilet. I use a urinal. I don't sit down. No, you know, that, that was in those days. That was because they were they were camel herders. You know, they took care of camels. They took care of, they didn't have, they were similar. I stand up and urinate as well today. That's what we would have said if a non-Muslim came and asked us this. You know, the brothers here at the back with me, when he, when he had his nikah done, Brother Usman, when he had his nikah done, he had a lot of non-Muslims there, and he said to me, give a little speech and talk. You know, the topic I spoke about was, I said, leave everything else. I said, let's talk about Istinja, wiping your backside. I said, you guys don't know how to wipe your backside, and you call us uncivilized. Call us uncivilized. Salman Farsi was given this question, and he said to him that your prophet has told you how to clean your backside as well. I'm paraphrasing. What did Salman Farsi said? He said, Ajal, Ajal. You know, in the Arabic language, Ajal means, one is you say, like people like me and you say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, he said it, but, you know, you understand what I'm trying to say. Ajal in the Arabic language means, of course, why not? Why not? And then he didn't stop there. He said, he told us, don't use your right hand when you're doing this job. Don't use bones or any other filth to clean yourself. Why? Because this is filthy. He also told us, do not face the Qibla. Do not, do not uh, face the Qibla with your front side or the back side when relieving yourself. Of course, the Prophet taught us how to relieve ourselves. You know, if we had people like this in our community, we wouldn't be degraded like we are today in our communities. But unfortunately, my brothers, we're going through this phase. And the message of Allah told us that this will happen. But glad tidings for the strangers will preserve their iman and their beliefs. They won't feel ashamed of their religion. Even if it means that they have to go through difficulty, they will not be ashamed of this. They won't be ashamed of this. Moving on. These I presented to you. The Prophet ﷺ said, continuously there will be one jamaat, one group that will remain. They will fight for the sake of Allah. They will not be bothered about anybody who forsakes them. Who is going to forsake them? The kuffar are already their enemies. It is the Muslims who will forsake them. Muslims. And how many Muslims do you find? I mean, a couple of months ago, I was sitting, there was a gathering and there was a topic being mentioned and there's brother saying, oh, brother, they're just fighting for money anyway. Have you opened up his heart and looked inside his intention and seen what he's fighting for? 
sitting here. Oh, they don't even pray in the masjid anyway. Palestinians, they don't even pray their son. Actually gone there and seen how the, the Zionists and the Israeli government restrict youngsters and certain age groups from going inside Masjid al to pray their salah. How do you know? How do you know? And this is why, my brothers, when we behave in this manner, then we will be in the decadence that we are seeing ourselves in. The message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa explained. And it teaches us, before I move on to the next thing, it teaches us, number one, my brothers, Imam Mahdi will not come out from any university or college. Imam Mahdi will be linked to those people who are fighting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number two, not only Imam Mahdi, but Isa alayhi salam will be linked to these group of people as well. And I'm trying to link it into today's context, my brothers. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, and we can only, this is a possibility, we cannot say 100% with your thing, but I'll explain a few points and I leave the decision up to you to decide. The Messenger of Allah said, Abdullah bin Haris radiallahu anhu said, the Messenger of Allah said, Yahruju nasu min al -mashriki. A group of people will emerge from the east. Yuwaddi'una lil mahdi, yani sultanahu. There will be a group of people who will emerge from the east and they will lay down the foundations for Imam Mahdi. When we look around the world today, my brothers, which country is it that has upholded the principles of Islam? Which country is it that did not bow down in front of anybody besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Which country was it that when it came to handing over a Muslim brother, they acted upon that one hadith and the whole country was decimated? Based upon that one hadith, which country was it that was ready to uphold the honor and dignity of their fellow Muslim brothers and sisters? That is the country known as the Islamic Emirates, Emirate of Afghanistan. If there is any hope of any group supporting Imam Mahdi when he emerges, keeping in mind today's context, it is this group of people. It is these people. And the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa has indicated in the ahadith certain ways that these people are the ones. You know, look at, just try to understand my brothers. How many years they fought against the Russians? How many years did they, were they occupied by the American forces? Not only America, United Nations, the NATO forces. You know how many forces were, were, were sent into Afghanistan? Anybody know? You know how many countries were in there? It wasn't just America and Britain. Over nations had their armies inside Afghanistan. 50 nations. People come to you, brother, I think my peer, local peer sahab, he's a wali of Allah. Why is he doing? You tell him, talk about basic principles of religion, he hides in the cupboard. You ask him translation of the verse of the Quran, he's, he's run miles away. And then you have these people who not only upholded the principles of Islam, they actually destroyed a, an army and force which has never been seen in the history of mankind. Have you ever have you ever heard 50 nations advancing upon one country, one, one group of people in the history of mankind? We've heard of armies attacking another army. There might be thousands, but you've got countries after countries. You know, there was a few countries, I was checking the statistics. You had certain countries, I can't remember the name. Just to join in, you know, to, you know, like back in the days, I'm just explaining this youngsters here. Back in the days, you know, when you're in school and we, we're all guilty of this, some of us, when somebody was getting jumped, yeah, you, you jump in one of the boys, he's getting beaten up. And just because you want to give your bucket as well, you get in there and you start kicking as well, you start punching. And I'm not advocating of violence or anything. We all, we've all done this. We were ignorant. Nobody told us. We're not angels here. We've all done it by mistake. And you, you know, you throw your little punch, you try to hit him, somebody slaps him in the head as well, and he runs out the mouth so that nobody can see. So here, you had a few countries, they didn't even have an army. And certain countries like Slovakia, if I can remember, they sent three soldiers into Afghanistan. Three soldiers. Some of them sent two. One, just so that we can get our barakat as well inside Afghanistan. And then what happened? They sent them back with Mithai from Mushtaq Sweet Center, mashallah. And that is why, my brothers, Imam Mahdi, the army, and those who will help and assist, what we're looking at today's context is these people. 20 years ago, when the war on terror took place, when you were to ask people, what is happening, brother, quietly, in the secret, closed, you know, four walls in the room, they say, yeah, yeah, you know what, it's wrong. 
So I ask you, where is the evidence of Osama bin Laden's involvement in, involvement in the 9-11 terror attacks? Till today, they haven't produced a single document to prove that the, the of, of money people, especially Mullah Umar and the likes of Osama bin Laden had an involvement inside September 11 terrorist attacks. Mullah Abdul Salam, who was the ex-ambassador for Taliban, in his book, it's been translated into the English language. He said, I asked, sent letters to the, the White House saying, send over the documents to prove that Osama bin Laden had some for, sort of involvement in the September 11th attacks. He says, he sent it to Musharraf, beloved Musharraf, but he said, till when he was writing, he said, till today, I haven't seen the documents. I haven't seen the documents. What does our Islam teach us, my brothers? al bayinatu al mudda'i The one who is the claimant, he needs to bring the proof. He needs to bring the evidence. And according to that, my brothers, till today, we say openly, without any shame, in defense of our Muslim brothers and sisters, that they were innocent and these people did not have a problem with them because of some terrorist act. It was only based upon their principles and their love for the sake of Allah and His Messenger. That is why I mentioned a few things and then I'll finish, inshallah. Everyone, stay with me. The topic of Imam Mahdi, my brothers, as I was mentioning, the topic of Imam Mahdi, we all believe, if we want to follow the, the way of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we look into the books of Ahadith and we find that this topic, Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Sqalani rahimahullah mentions, he says that the, the subject of Imam Mahdi has been mentioned so much time and time again in the books of Hadith that it has reached the level of Tawatur. tawatur. What does Tawatur mean? Tawatur means that a subject or a hadith reaches such a uh, level wherein in every single era, the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, Tabu Tabi'een, there are so many people narrating this subject that to logically think that they made this up is impossible. You can't believe that it's, it's, it can ever happen. It's impossible. People narrated it in Iraq. Sahaba mentioned it in Iraq, mentioned it in Kufa, mentioned it in Syria, in Medina. It's impossible that they all got together, they had WhatsApp and they made a WhatsApp group and said, let's all na'uzu billah, make something up against the Messenger of Allah. It's impossible. There was no WhatsApp in those days anyway. It's impossible. And Allah Suyuti Rahmatullah says, Tawatur is not Tawatur al lafzi meaning the words exactly the same. Each and every era, the, the companions, Sabi'in, they narrated it a word to word. It doesn't mean that. It means tawatule ma'nawi, meaning the subject that has been discussed revolves around the topic of Imam Ali. And the scholars mention approximately 90 ahadiths have been mentioned in relation to the topic of Imam Ali. 25 companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam have reported on the emergence and the topic of Imam Mahdi. Three great muhaddisin, the likes of Imam Tirmizi, Imam Abu Dawood, and Imam Ibn Majah, every single one of these three, they have mentioned a subject heading under the title of Imam Mahdi uh, and in relation to his life and his emergence. If these great scholars and these individuals have mentioned that Imam Mahdi is part of our Aqidah, then somebody in the 21st century or somebody who lives under a uh, uh, you know, in the UK or America or anywhere else, if we say something, then what you need to do is make it enter from one ear and let it zoom out 100 miles per hour from the... You don't need to listen to this nonsense. Because we believe that what the pious predecessor said, it was free from nafs, shaitan, and the pressure of the governments that they lived in under. They followed the true teachings of Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet ﷺ then went on further and he said that when Imam when when the when Imam Mahdi will be in Makkah Mukarama, approximately according to the nation, 313 men will give bayah upon the hands of Imam Mahdi. And I told you bayah is not that they're gonna go on Jamaat for three days or 40 days, and there's no disregard for Jamaat. What they're gonna do bayah upon is to fight for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are going to do bear upon the hands of Imam Mahdi, 313. When this takes place, there will be a man by the name of Sufiani. The Messenger of Allah said, he will be in the Damascus, Syria area. He will find out that Imam Mahdi has emerged. And that is why the Saudi government of today, mashallah, 
They love us so much. That is why they have cameras in each and every corner in Makkah Mukarama. Because they want to see your beautiful face. They want to see what you're doing at every moment of your time inside Makkah and Medina. Or is it the fact that they want to see where Imam Mahdi is going to be? And where, what is he going to do? And where are those 313 individuals who will give bear upon his hands? The Messenger of Allah said, those who will give bear upon his hands, they will be 313. And they will have the reward similar to the people of Badr in the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa upon occasion, Jibreel came to the Messenger of Allah and said to the Messenger of Allah, that, what do you think of participating in Badr? How do you regard them amongst your companions? The Messenger of Allah said, those who participate in Badr, they are from the greatest of my companions. They are the greatest. And, the, and Jibreel alayhi salam said to the Messenger of Allah, those angels who descended upon the occasion of the Battle of Badr, in the same way, we regard them as the greatest of the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know why, my brothers? Why? 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 Because location, time, and what you do, and when you do it, is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At this moment in time, why do you think in our Sharia, why did the message of Allah, why did Umar bin Khattab categorize the Sahaba when he would go through an issue, he'd say to his companions, go and call the Sahaba brother. Let me do mashra with them. If no, none of the brother are there, call, call those who are Ashabu Hudaybiyah, the Hudaybiyah Sahaba, who gave bear, who pledged uh, allegiance upon the hands of the message of Allah. If they're not there, call the, 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 the anybody else who remains from the, the Sami Kun al Awalun, the first and foremost who embrace Islam. Bring them, let me do mashra with them. And you actually think people are here and you think living in a secular society, living in when we're faced with these issues, if I close my mouth and zip it, I actually think, do I actually believe that on the day of judgment, Allah will give me the reward of those who actually done something for the sake of Allah and His Messenger? Allah looks at time, location. That is why Isa a.s. when he will emerge and those believers will be going through difficulties at the hands of Dajjal. It's mentioned in the books of Hadith. He will go to them, he will wipe their faces, he will remove that has covered their faces. He will make dua for them and tell them, Allah has a lofty status for you in the Akhirah. Lofty status for people like me and you who run in the closet and hide behind closed doors. And when the going gets tough, and when I need to stand up for principles, lock the door, swallow the key so nobody can enter the room. Or when I give, when I talk about Quran and Hadith, if jihad is mentioned in the Quran, I don't give the meaning of jihad, I'll say, yes, striving and struggling. Like I strive and struggling when I open the fridge to take out a bottle of water, that is also jihad as well. Wallahi, people interpret the Hadith like this in this manner. They interpret like this, brother, I am doing mental jihad. What are you doing? Mental jihad. Brother, I'm fighting nafs and shaitan in my mind. This is jihad as well. So what the message of Allah, what the companions did in Badr, Uhad, Hudaybiyah, you're belittling it and you're saying, sitting at home eating ice, ice cream when it was 40 degrees, this is also jihad as well. These are all forms of corrupting the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you don't have the courage to stand up and explain the true religion, then the least you can do is keep your mouth shut and support those who are actually doing the right thing. After this, my brothers, the Pledge of Allegiance will take place. Sufiani will come. When he will emerge, he, Sufiani will send an army. And he will send an army to go and kill Imam Mahdi and those believers who have done pledge allegiance on his hand. And the Messenger of Allah said they will reach a location known as Bayda, which is not so far off from Zul Hulayfa in Medina Munawwara. They will reach that land. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause the first and the last to be swallowed up by the earth. And there will only be one chamcha left inside that group. He will go running back and inform Sufiani and tell them that this is what happened. And then he will come himself to try and kill Na'udhu Billah Imam Mahdi. And when this action takes place, the whole world will find out that Imam Mahdi, the Muslim Ummah will find out that Imam Mahdi has emerged and therefore, they will all flock towards wherever Imam Mahdi will be at the time. The narrations mentioned at the age of 40, Allah will inspire him and he will do exactly what I've just mentioned. And then for the next seven years of his life, approximately at the age of 47, for the next seven years, he will try his utmost best 
to remove the suffering of the Muslim on Ummah wherever they are. Now, till today, many brothers approached me and previously over the years as well, they said that will the Jal come before Mahdi or will Mahdi come before the Jal? So the reality is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. However, the way things are going in the current climate, the way I feel is that the Jal will emerge first and then Imam Mahdi will come afterwards. Meaning within a close period of time. The Jal will emerge and then Mahdi will come and the Jal will cause his fitter and facade and before he emerges or during that process, Imam Mahdi will go about fixing and taking care of the Muslim Ummah. For seven years, he will try to ensure that the Muslim Ummah is blessed through his blessings and none of the believers are caused any harm. Then for the next couple of years, 47 from 48 to 49, 47 and 48, the following year, that is when the Muslims will go into battle against the enemies of the Muslims. And the books of Hadith, some people have said, oh, it's Russia today. Russia, they've had an alliance with the Muslims, the Chechen Muslims, and they are combining their forces and they're fighting against. This is all nonsense. This is all nonsense. Russia, the same Russia that is bomb bombing and killing our Muslim brothers in Syria. The same Russia, Putin, beloved Putin, sorry, who is bombing and killed previously our Muslims who was who was built upon fitna and facade, who caused a lot of corruption and facade, killing the Muslims in Syria and even in Chechnya as well. The like of Saifullah, Commander Khattab, who fought against Putin and his forces. How can we ever forget this? How can we ever forget this? When Imam Mahdi comes and he arrives, he will have an alliance with Christian forces, but only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows which forces these are. When this alliance takes place, my brothers, what will happen? The Christians and the Muslims will join forces and they will fight a common enemy. When they fight a common enemy, that enemy will be defeated and the Muslims will start distributing the spoils of war. And when they distribute the spoils of war, the Christian army, the leaders will say to the Muslim, and Imam Mahdi, that in the spoils of war, there are certain captives who are Muslims. Hand them over to us. Hand them over to us. And you know, subhanAllah, I mentioned this previously. It's a it's an eye-opener for us. When they will say this to the Muslims, if that was me and you in our day and age, they say, yeah, brother, hand him over. Who cares, yaar? Bring, sell him, give it to him, give it to him. So, again, give it to him. Give his house number, his address, his family number, Facebook account. WhatsApp number, everything, send it over, brother. Who cares? Who cares? You know, the snitches in our community, they will do this. But what will the Muslims do? Because they, their foundations are upon the true teachings of Allah and His Messenger. When they are posed with this question, they will say, Wallahi, la nukhali baynana wa bayna ikhwanina. We cannot hand over our Muslim brothers. They've embraced Islam. Previously, the scholars mentioned it's possible that they will embrace Islam after the battle and they will become Muslims. Now that they become Muslims, they belong to us. We can't hand them over. And if they were Muslims before this, then even more we can't hand them, hand them over to the non-Muslims, the Christians. When they will say this, the Christians will say, hand them over, otherwise we will go and fight against each other. The Muslims will not deprive these Muslims who are captured. They will join the forces of the Muslims and the battle between the Muslims and the Christians will take place. My brothers, I ask you, do I live my life as a Muslim based upon principles or do I sell my religion, wake up in the morning as a Muslim and by evening do I sell my religion for a dollar and a dime? Most of us in our communities, this is exactly what they do. And here the Hadith mentions they are ready to fight on the basis of not handing over their own Muslim brothers. Where do you see a glimpse of this, my brothers? You see this in Afghanistan. How they were not ready to hand over one Muslim brother of theirs and they destroyed the entire, you know, there was there were people going around saying, oh, you know what, it was better if they handed over, it was better if they handed over Osama bin Laden so that the whole country is saying, you know, I met a brother, a scholar who, were, who met an alim who was in that gathering where a delegation of ulama from Pakistan went over and they went to speak to Mullah Omar when he was alive, hand, hand him over and save your entire country. You know what he replied? This is what he called principles, my brothers, principles. Mullah Umar listened to the conversation. 
They said, do this. If you don't do this, children are going to die. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. And nobody replied, Mullah Umar, Rahmatullah what did he say? He said, listen, tell me. When, if Uthman bin Affan was alive, and Abu Bakr and Umar were alive, and the rebels were demanding that Uthman be handed over to them, do you think Abu Bakr and Umar would have handed over Uthman to the rebels? No chance. He said, if Abu Bakr and Umar would not hand over Uthman, how do you expect me to hand over my Muslim brother? Come from Medina, living here under our country, free. He hasn't done anything wrong. Why should we hand him over to non-Muslims? This is what you call principles, my brothers. Principles is are this, that when they say to you, do you believe in homosexuality? And you say, yes, homosexuality is okay. Where is your principles gone? When they face you with questions, you give in. You give in. This is not what Islam teaches us, my brothers. Islam teaches us that we are proud of our religion and at the same time, there's no need for us to apologize for something that happens around the world. When the Christians apologize for the Christian massacre that takes place at the hands of Christians killing Muslims, that's when we will apologize as well. But they don't do it, so why should we do it? So again, my brothers, just finishing off, 48 years in the life of Imam Mahdi, this will take place, a war will take place between the Muslims and the Christians. The message of Allah mentioned that when this war will take place, one third of the Muslim army, when they will see the Christian forces, they will drop their weapons, turn around, and run back from the other side direction. The Messenger of Allah said, these group of people will not be forgiven in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will not accept their tawbah, Allah will not forgive them. A second group of people will come, and they will go in the battlefield with the intention that we're not going to come back alive, we're going to give our lives. We're going to fight till death. The Messenger of Allah said, this second group of people, they will do this, they will be of the shuhada. They will be the greatest martyrs in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala include us amongst them. Amen. MashaAllah, everybody said Amin. Normally when I make this dua, people say, Amin. <laughs> Amin. And if I said, may Allah give long, healthy life to Boris Johnson, Amin. This is what we're living, we're facing with. And then the third group of people, my brothers, third group of people, what is going to happen? They will go into the battle and they will fight and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant them victory. And through this victory, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant much uh, abundance of spoils of war to the believers. And then during this period of time, which I mentioned in the beginning, that when this is taking place, the Imam Mahdi will be approached, Shaitan will make an announcement, either Shaitan himself or a human being in the form of Shaitan, he will make an announcement and say that, the Jal has taken over your homes. He has he has taken over whatever you own. And some have mentioned this is in relation to conquering Constantinople, present day Istanbul. Allah knows best. We can't put our hand on the pulse and say with your team, this is exactly what is going to happen. We can only assume and leave the rest in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But one thing is for certain, my brothers, which you don't hear from these storytellers. One thing is for certain that we need to open our eyes and realize which, which group of people are doing what and where do I stand in relation to the true teachings of Allah and His Messenger? Because if you follow principles, then when the time arises, automatically Allah will guide you to do the right thing at the right moment, at the right time. If, with stories, then I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit there and say, yeah, especially this hadith is mentioned over here. We have to open our minds and our hearts. The Messenger of Allah said, these group of people will be informed that the Jal has emerged and he has taken over their homes. The message of Allah said, Imam Mahdi will send a group of horsemen. And the Prophet said, there was no need for him to say this. There was no need. But to show his attachment and his love and affection for this group of people, he said, Inni la a'rifu asma'ahum. I know their names. I know their father's names. And I know the color upon which horses they will ride to go and see if that information is correct. And then they will return and they will find out that the information was false. After they return, only then will the Jal emerge and the fitting of the Jal will emerge. This is a separate topic in itself. Now before finishing, my brothers, the, 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 the scholars of Hadith mentioned that there is no specific Hadith which mentions that where, where the exact location of Imam Mahdi will be when he passes away. There is not an exact Hadith which mentions where he will pass away and where he will be buried. The scholars, you mentioned this, that at the age of 49, 
when the child will emerge and he will be killed by Isa alayhi salam, the whole world will embrace Islam. And after embracing Islam, he will travel with Isa alayhi salam, doing dawah and spreading Islam and the beautiful teachings of the religion of Islam. At the age of 49, he will pass away and he will be married. But the books of Hadith do not mention the exact location of where he will be married. Now the last thing I want to finish upon is the question that is remains is where do I stand in relation to my religion, my belief, and what do I do at this current moment in time? The first thing we need to do, my brothers, is not be ashamed of the teachings of our beautiful religion. You know why? Let me make it clear. When a group of people have a dictionary and that dictionary has conveyed to them interpretation of words which make no sense whatsoever, how can you expect them to appreciate the teachings of Islam? In the Western civilization, again, coming back to the fourth category which I mentioned, what is the fourth category? A kingdom which is based upon zulm and oppression, which we're going through at this moment in time. If I live under a government which deems robbing the wealth of other people in society, robbing it through paperwork and documents, they classify this as halal. How can I ever explain to them the teachings of our religion, beautiful religion of Islam? Because our diction dictionaries are totally different. Islam explains robbing the wealth of others totally different to the way they've understood. How can we ever come to one platform? If I want this to take place, I need to understand the dictionary meaning of my own religion of Islam. Then I can convey the true teaching to the non-Muslims. That is the first thing. Appreciate, understand orthodox Islam, which is slowly fading away, living inside the UK. Number two, my brothers, is number two thing that we need to do is that alongside understanding our religion, number two, according to my capacity and my ability, I need to help and assist those who are assisting and helping the true teachings of Allah and His Messenger. How many brothers are here? Who maybe maybe they can't vocally they can't express themselves uh, in the best manner, but they can write documents down. They can do some work, write uh, some some PDFs or uh, some paperwork in defense of the religion of Islam. Put pen to paper and start defending the religion of Islam. According to my ability and capacity, I should start defending the religion of Islam. And number three, my brothers, is the third thing that we need to do is. We need to start behaving like what has been mentioned by the message of Allah. What is this? That they glad tidings to the strangers of this ummah. If you want to be given Jannah in the hereafter, you're going to have to include yourself amongst the strangers. And who are the strangers? They are those people who are looked down upon their own communities in their own communities because they stick to the true principles and teachings of the religion of Islam. And you know, before I finish, the, the hadith of Hudayfa radiallahu an, he mentioned, I, did I say there are five stages, five, five, four stages, we're in the fourth one, and the fifth one is what the Messenger of Allah said, after the fourth stage passes by, there will be a fifth stage, and the Messenger of Allah said, ثُمَّ تَكُونُ خِلَافَةٌ عَلَى مِنْ Then another stage will arrive, and what is that stage going to be? It will be the whole world. And the kingdom and leadership will be based upon the methodology upon the methodology of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And for that to arrive, it will be under the leadership leadership of Imam Mahdi Isa alayhi salam, and with the removal of the jal, and then the whole world will embrace the teachings of Islam. But for that to happen, I myself need to be inside the fourth stage as a stranger, so that I can preserve the teaching of Islam and understand when. Imam Mahdi arrives so that I can join his army and be with him when things become difficult. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to understand these points. I try to uh, summarize it in a nutshell. There's many other things we can talk about, but these are very important points. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give first of all me the ability to practice upon what has been mentioned. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve our Iman and Islam during these testing times. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give us the ability to stand with truth and uphold the truth whenever the time arises. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help and assist 
the Ummah, wherever they are, our brothers and sisters around the world. And lastly and most importantly, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrect us, all of us, our family members, our brothers and sisters, our beloved ones, wherever they are, whoever they are from the Ummah, may Allah resurrect all of us with Iman and Islam on the Day of Judgment. Ameen wa akhiru ta'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khidati Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum, my brothers and sisters. Um, Alhamdulillah, we're here today on behalf of Umba Welfare Trust, an organization which uh, we've been here many times before. And 